Hello, this is Mike Corelli with the Introduction to United States Government course online. Welcome. Today's lecture is entitled Constitution, Form, and Function. This lecture is meant to be combined with our next lecture, titled Federalism. Using both lectures, we'll be answering today's seminar question. As with our Declaration of Independence lecture, this lecture was recorded in front of a live class. This in order to give you, the online student, the look and feel of sitting in a classroom, hearing your classmates ask questions, and, heaven forbid, hearing me answer them. So again, welcome. Class is about to start. Please take your seat and let's begin. And so what we're doing tonight is we're examining the Constitution in form and function. We're dealing with Chapter 2 in Bards et al., American Government and Politics Today. So everybody's read the book, right? Everybody's read the Constitution that's appended to Chapter 2. So everybody's really familiar with the Articles of Confederation, with the uh, major compromises met in the Constitutional Convention, right? by the ratification process, by the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists, the birth of the Bill of Rights, these should all sound familiar. I'm not giving you like a pop quiz, but I'm going down this laundry list because if you've done the reading, they should at least sound somewhat familiar, right? There, you have a nodding acquaintance with some of these terms. Excellent, excellent. Well, then I'll go ahead and introduce our seminar question for tonight, which is, how and why was the Constitution created? What are the main features of the government under the Constitution? What conflicts emerged first during the writing of the Constitution and later during the ratification debate? So, as we're wont to do at the end of tonight's lecture, I'll repost the seminar question and I'll also give you uh, my version of a thesis statement. Now, the thesis statement that we did for last week's seminar question was really simple. Because the question was a single sentence, all we needed to do was to strike off the question mark, anything that sounded like a question, and turn it into a statement, right? So it was fairly easy. That was child's play. Turning this one into a thesis statement is a little more fraught. It takes a little more crafting because it's actually three different statements. How and why was the Constitution created is one. What are the main features of government under the Constitution is two. And then what conflicts emerged during the writing and during the ratification. So there's actually three different questions. But what happens oftentimes is when people look at a complex question like this or a multifaceted question, they tend to answer one part of it at the expense of perhaps the other two parts, which is an error because the question is the question in its entirety. And so by creating a good single thesis statement out of these three questions, you actually give yourself a good outline, right? A road map. So crafting a strong thesis statement allows you to develop a well-constructed outline. Because it's the thesis statement that's going to drive what elements you're going to talk about. May I give you an example? So a couple of semester goes, semesters ago, I had a great student who did a great job trying to answer this question. He went on for about a page and a half talking about the American flag and the history of the American flag and the meaning of the American flag, which was really interesting and it was really well written and pretty well researched and really had nothing to do with the question, right? Because he didn't have a strong thesis statement, he felt that he needed to fill the space. And so he went off on a tangent on something that was interesting but not related. So by creating a strong thesis statement, giving yourself a well-constructed outline, you're able to be fearless in your editing. Being fearless in your editing, being clear about what your topic is, what your thesis is, is the best gift you can give your reader. There's nothing more frustrating to a reader than going off onto tangents with you. We know the best <laughs> tool in writing an essay is to Tell them you're going to tell them, tell them, and tell them you told them, right? So your thesis statement is you're telling them you're going to tell them. Your outline is telling them. 
and then a strong conclusion where I really encourage you to simply restate your thesis statement as a strong conclusion because that way your reader ends their experience with your paper with a sense of completion. Oh, that's right. They told me they were going to tell me. They told me. And here they're concluding with the same thesis statement they started with. And I can see where they covered X, Y, and Z. Good. And so they walk away from your essay with a sense of accomplishment. So that's the seminar question and a little advice in essay writing. Now this is my roadmap for tonight's lecture. I always try to give you an idea of where we're going to go so that you can follow along. And so my conclusion is going to be re-invoking the seminar question number two. But before we get there, what we're going to do is we're going to define our terms. We're going to talk about the Articles of Confederation. We're going to talk about the Constitution as the codification of the social contract. And I'll define that. We're going to talk about the format of the Constitution, the main compromises met by its drafters. We'll talk about factionalism among the delegates in large part focusing on the Federalist Papers and the Anti-Federalist response. We'll talk about the Bill of Rights, which are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. And we'll talk about the other 17 amendments. So we'll talk about all 27 amendments to the Constitution tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about the Madisonian model. And we're going to do a little pen, pen and ink correction to your textbook, because Barbara Bards and I disagree wholeheartedly about the definition of the Madisonian model, and I win because I'm here and she's not. And then we'll re-invoke the seminar question, seminar question number two. So everybody cool? Where are we going? All right. So let's start off our conversation by clearing up a misconception. How many people in here believe that we live in a democracy? Obviously, I'm leading you down the primrose path, right? There are elements of democracy in our system of government. True. It's founded on democratic principles, yes, but we don't live in a democracy. We live in a constitutional republic. If we truly lived in a democracy, we would be voting on all policy issues directly. A constitutional republic means that sovereignty rests with the people, and through our constitutional mechanism, we have representatives who make law on our behalf as part of the constitutional authority given to them. So let's look at political systems generally to help me kind of flesh out this, this idea. First, you have a monarchy. You know this word, the rule of a king, the rule of one, a king, a queen, a czar, a czarina, a pope, a dictator, a tyrant. The rule of one, no matter what you call that one, it's the rule of an individual, a monarchy. Another type of political system would be an oligarchy. Now remember, Plato and Aristotle both touched on these when we introduced them last week in our philosophic background. An oligarchy is ruled by a group. And so whether that group is an aristocracy, if you look at the parliament under the Commonwealth in England after the beheading of Charles I, England was run by an oligarchy. Whether that group is defined, as I suggest, by nobility or by noble blood and aristocracy. What about a group identified by religion, like the Puritans, or a sect of religion? What about a group identified by race, by ownership of property, by education, by gender? These are all group identifications that would fit into the definition of an oligarchy, when a group imposes its will on others. A democracy, as I suggest, is ruled by the people. The root is demos kratian, or the people rule. In a republic, you have the terms re publica, re public, republic, where re is the thing and publica is public. So it's the thing public, which is the translation of republic. The thing is the law, or the public law. So republic is a system of government, a political system, that is founded on the rule of law, and not the rule of an individual, a group, or the people as a whole. An anarchy 
is the absence of a political system. These are hard to quantify. They're hard to study because we know that nature abhors a vacuum. And if there is no system of government, I assure you that one will fill that void quickly. Whether it's the rule of a one or the rule of a group, you're not going to be long with an anarchy or an anarchistic government. It's antithetical. All right, so let me give you an example then of the difference between democracy, perhaps, and a republic. The flaw in democracy, or in the people rule, is the idea that the majority is unrestrained. It's what James Madison called the tyranny of the majority. That in a democracy, the, the most people voting, the most people agreeing, win the day. They win the vote. They win the policy decision. Which means that there's a minority who are going to be subjected to and must obey the will of the majority. So the potential for the tyranny of the majority exists in a pure democracy. So put on your, put on your 10 gallon hat, right? And go back to the wild west and imagine that I am a horse thief. Well, let's say I'm accused of being a horse thief and along comes a posse, right? Along comes a group of men, let's say 15, 20 of them. And they're convinced they know because they're smart and they figure things out apparently that I'm the horse thief. And so they come at me, and they're going to hang me. Now, there may be two or three of the guys in the posse who have questions about my innocence, who aren't quite convinced, but they're in the minority. The majority say, Mike stole our horse, is, and so we're going to hang him. This is democracy. This is majority rule. Along comes a sheriff, and the sheriff says, hang on there, cowpokes, right? We have a law. The law says that this person is accused of a crime, has the right to face his accusers, has the right to a trial, trial by jury, has the right to the due process of law, and if the due process of law then, or through the due process of law, we find him guilty, then there's a penalty, and the penalty is established by that law whether it's hanging or 10 years in prison, for whatever he is found guilty of. Oh, there, and there's one more element. He is innocent until proven guilty. The burden of proof is on you, those who are trying to find him guilty, not on him to prove his innocence. The burden of proof rests with those trying to seek his condemnation. Does this make sense? And so this is a republic. This is a political system that's based on the rule of law and not on the will of the majority whatever majority happens to be at the time, whatever reason. Now, this is a pretty simple example, but extrapolate it, right? We want to take away your rights. We want to deny you your right. We, the majority, are going to impose our will on a minority. Well, okay, but it's through the due process. We have to run it through our political mechanisms before that can happen, if at all. So we don't live in a democracy. There are elements of democracy in our constitutional republic. Now, as we did the first night and the second night, I like to go back to founder's intent. Remember the picture of the horse and the horse's mouth? I said that we're going to often go back to the founder's intent. To that end, tonight I'm going to be citing many of the Federalist Papers. Now, these you've, talked, you've touched on in your reading, so you're familiar with the idea of the Federalist Papers. And I'll introduce them more as we go on. But this one is Federalist number 39, written by James Madison, called The Conformity of the Plan to Republican Principles. Now, just a quick break. When I say Republican, remember, this isn't Republican-Democrat. This isn't about a political party. That's not what I'm referring to. Republicanism is an ideal where sovereignty rests with the people, right, as spoken through a law or a constitution. The first question that offers itself is whether the general form and aspect of the government be strictly Republican. It is evident that no other form would be reconcilable with the genius of the American people, with the fundamental principles of the revolution, or with that honorable determination which animates every votary of freedom to rest all our political experiments on the capacity of mankind for self-government. If we resort 
for a criterion to different principles on which different forms of government are established, we may define a republic to be, or at least may bestow that name on, a government which derives all its powers directly or indirectly from the great body of the people and is administered by persons holding their offices during pleasure for a limited period or during good behavior. It is essential to a, such a government that it be derived from the great body of the society and not from an inconsiderable proportion, a small port proportion, or a favored class of it. Otherwise, a handful of tyrannical nobles exercising their oppressions by a delegation of their powers might aspire to the rank of Republicans and claim for their government the honorable title of Republic. According to the constitution of every state in the Union, some or other of the officers of government are appointed indirectly only by the people. On comparing the constitution planned by the convention, the constitution that we're studying tonight, with the standard here fixed, we perceive at once that it is, in the most rigid sense, conformable to it. The House of Representatives, that one branch, at least of all, the state legislatures, is elected immediately by the great body of the people. The Senate, like the present Congress and the state of Maryland, derives its appointment indirectly from the people. We'll talk about this mechanism in a moment. The president is indirectly derived from the choice of the people, according to the example in most of the several states. Even the judges, with all other officers of the union, will, as in the several states, be the choice, through though a remote choice, of the people themselves. The duration of the appointments is equally conformable to the Republican standard. So Federalist number 39, James Madison arguing for ratification of the Constitution, explaining its conformity to Republican principles. So straight from the horse's mouth, yes? Now, what I'm going to try to assert here is that this law, this public thing, is the social contract. The law, the Constitution, is our social contract. That thing that Hobbes and Rousseau and Montesquieu were talking about. Remember Charles I of England? Right? I made a big deal of pulling up a chair and saying, there sits this poor SOB, right? He can't defend himself because if he so much as speaks or acknowledges the existence of the people who are trying him, it is tantamount to giving them authority. He couldn't speak, he couldn't defend himself because he was the personification of sovereignty. Well, in a republic, the supreme power of the state is the voice of the governed. And this is an age of enlightenment ideal. When you look up legitimacy in your textbook, it talks about the popular authority, the popular acceptance of a form of government. So we're looking at the supreme power of the state being the voice of the governed. This idea, this Republican principle, is guaranteed in the Declaration of Independence by citing the authority of these good people, the good people of these colonies, as the supreme power of the state that gave their actions legitimacy. Does that sound familiar? Yes? Remember we read it last week? Okay. So if a government lacked popular authority, any government subsequent to the Declaration of Independence lacked popular authority, I would argue that the ideals, the Age of Enlightenment ideals in the Declaration of Independence are lost. The great noble fight that were the, the principles of the Declaration of Independence, if they're not affected in a form of government, are lost. They were nothing but hot air. If we could just go back to a monarchy or to some kind of an oligarchy or even to a direct democracy, those principles would be lost. So what I'm arguing is that the state-by-state -state ratification process that's discussed in your book, and we're going to talk about it again tonight, proves that... Uh, the Constitution was accepted by popular referendum or popular acceptance through the state legislatures, through the mechanisms that existed at the time. Then the Constitution is the codification of the social contract. 
The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. It is the one time, the one and only time, we the people, the sovereign, spoke to create law, to create that public law. It is the Constitution. All other laws, whether at the national or at the state level, all executive orders, all bureaucratic regulations, all judicial findings subsequent are made by the authority of the Constitution. Check. So the Constitution is the supreme will of the sovereign. We, the people, spoke and created this law. Therefore, there is no law that is higher than the Constitution because all law is made by the authority of the Constitution. Check. So the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, which means, if you're following me down the primrose path here, that no person, no constituent state, no law, no individual, no school district, no governor, no principal, no priest, no bishop, no nobody, nothing, can supplant the authority of the Constitution. If there is a contradiction between a state law and the Constitution, or between a national law and the Constitution, it's the law that falls, not the Constitution. The Constitution is supreme. And so, as we remember from last week, the social contract, this idea of how we come together to live together without knocking each other's blocks off, as examined by Locke and Montesquieu, but predominantly by Rousseau, Define what reasonable government is and what the purposes of government is and how and why and when people come together to form a social contract. And so we discussed Jefferson's reduction of these philosophers, namely Rousseau and Locke, almost as we were joking, or I was joking last week, to the point of plagiarism, almost seemingly cutting and pasting from Locke. To wit, quote, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, semicolon, that when any, whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such forms as to them, to who, to the people, shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. So we're speaking in the Declaration of Independence about the government in Britain. But as I suggested, if the Declaration of Independence is worth its weight, these principles, these Enlightenment principles, better darn well be represented in the Constitution, yes? And so what I'm going to show you tonight, if I do my job right, is that there are two ways to amend the Constitution. One is by two-thirds of the Congress and three-fourths of state legislatures to agree to an amendment. This is the one that we've always used. There is another mechanism, though, which is two-thirds of state governments coming together to call for a constitutional convention. We've never used this mechanism, and you know, kind of God forbid that we do, because what it would effectively do is to rewrite the Constitution without the permission, participation, authority, even an invitation to the federal government. Interesting. So what's true in the Declaration of Independence better darn well be in the Constitution or we lose the principles that it was formed on. The Constitution is the codification of the social contract. Codification is simply a $10 word that means being made into law. Code is another way of saying law, like the penal code. Right, or the criminal code. Code is a system of law. And so cod, to codify is to make into law. Codification is to make into law. The Constitution is the being made into law of the social contract. So finally, we get to the Articles of Confederation. Woohoo! Right? This is where the fun starts. So how many people in here knew that there was a system of government that existed prior to the Constitution? Anybody in here? One person, maybe two people. Great, that's fine. Yay, we're doing our job right because we're here to learn these things. Now, the beautiful thing is the Articles of Confederation failed and failed miserably, miserably, I kid you not. 
And for its failure, for all its problems, for all its prickly thorns, it taught us what we needed to improve. So that when we came to craft the Constitution, we saw what hadn't worked in the Articles of Confederation and were able to make a more perfect union, a more perfect form of government to drive these United States. So then, what about the Articles of Confederation? Well, it was called the, Art the Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union, um, the Articles of Confederation for short, and it was, uh, as I suggest, the first governing document of the United States. It combined the 13 colonies of the American Revolution into a loose confederation. Now, confederation is one of those terms in your book, right? And so, who remembers what it means? What is the definition of a confederation? Anybody? Confederation. Even a wild guess. Okay. It's going to be one of those nights. Huh? To band together. To band together. Thank you. How about being, exactly, to band together. Brave soul. Thank you very much. Uh, Corey, right? Casey. Huh? Okay, close. Casey. Casey, close. I knew it was a C. Sorry. Thank you, Casey. So banding together, coming together in a loose confederation or a group of individual independent states who are coming together in a treaty for self-defense and, to some extent, um, economic trade. It wasn't a national government, as we know, a national government today. It was a loose confederation, a treaty. It did establish the name of the United States, and it explained the rights possessed by any state and the amount of power to which any state is entitled. It establishes this as a league of states united for their common defense, the security of their liberties, and their mutual and general welfare, binding themselves to assist each other against all tax, attacks made upon them. It did establish the freedom of movement of citizens between these independent states, and all people were entitled to the rights of the states that they were entering, and extradition was allowed. So if you were a criminal and you were trying to scoot out of Virginia into, into New York, extradition was allowed, and they would come and get you and, and give you back. The system of government under the Articles of Confederation was that it allowed one vote in Congress to each state, which was entitled to a delegation between two and seven members, and there was no executive office. So first and foremost, there was a Congress, a unicameral Congress. Unicameral being one chamber, uni, like a unicycle. Unicameral, one house, one chamber. And so there wasn't a Senate and a House of Representatives as we have today. It was a single chamber where every state had one vote. So whether you were little New Jersey or little Delaware or huge New York or huge Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, Virginia, everybody had one vote. The delegations of the states could be between two and seven people. It depended on the state. And it really didn't matter to, to, the, to the Congress because you had one vote. So how that delegation decided to cast its one vote was on that delegation. Members were appointed by the state legislatures. They weren't elected by popular vote. And individuals could not serve more than three out of any six years. So this is, at its core, term limits. They were trying to forestall a professional political class. You can only serve three out of six years, or no more than half your time in Congress. The other half of the time, you had to go away and let somebody else represent your state. It limited the power of the central government to foreign relations and to declare war. But this is really kind of a joke, as I'm going to show you both John Adams and Thomas Jefferson were ambassadors during the Articles of Confederation. John Adams to England, to the court of St. James, to King George, and Thomas Jefferson to France. When John Adams went into the foreign secretary under King George to complain about the high-handedness of British shipping in American ports, he was fairly well laughed out of the Foreign Secretary's office because John Adams didn't really represent a cohesive, centralized government. There were 13 different governments. This was a loose confederation. So who did Adams represent? He had no teeth. There was no oomph, no authority in Adams' position. You see what I mean? There was an army that was raised for the common defense, but colonels and ranks below colonels were named not by the army, but by the state legislature. So here's how. 
If you have an army like we have today, it is the Army of the United States. Under the Continental Army, you had state militias. You had Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Virginia, contributing their militias to the Continental Army. Check. But only generals were given their rank by the central authority, by the Continental Congress. All the other officers, colonel and below, were given their rank by the states. Okay, so bear with me. Think about this politically. If your rank and your pay is coming from the state and not the central authority, to whom do you owe your loyalty? To the state, right? They're the ones who are paying your checks. They're the ones who are giving you your promotions, not the central. So your loyalty is going to rest with the states and not with the cohesive central. All expenditures by the United States will be paid uh, by funds raised by the state legislatures and apportioned to the state. So this was all a state-centric institution. It's all about the states and the rights of the states. The most important power that was denied the central government or Congress was the power of taxation. Anybody remember the golden rule? They have the gold make the rules. Right? And so if Congress didn't have the power to tax, if they had to go hat in hand to the states to support the central effort, and the states were broke, that contribution, that voluntary contribution to the central government was often lacking or not forthcoming. So Congress was often going hat in hand, begging for money, and the money wasn't coming. They didn't have the power to tax. And then I would argue that once the unity demanded by the Revolutionary War disbanded, dissipated, and the army disbanded, there was a small national force that was maintained, but because there wasn't a cohesive central authority to drive them or direct them, the army devolved into state militias. So there were 13 individual state militias, 13 individual state armies, and 11 navies. 11 distinct separate state navies. So this is the Articles of Confederation. So if we put the articles in historical context, it'll allow us an opportunity to see what happened to them and why they had to go and what caused the founding generation, what compelled them to recraft a new system, the Constitution that we have today. You ready? All right. So. Uh, 1783, the Treaty of Paris, which ended the Revolutionary War. But then, after the Revolutionary War was over, the army is disbanded, it's melting down, the states are becoming more and more and more self-identified. They're seeing themselves as the centralized authority, these individual states coming together in a loose confederation. So, two things happened at roughly one time that was the impetus for the Constitution. One is Shays Rebellion, and the other is the Annapolis Convention. Now, both of these are discussed in your book, right? Okay, so you know, you know these terms. Shays Rebellion, this is a lot of fun. If, you, if you're into history, if you're into the, the common man, the little guy standing up for what's his, this will really be a lot of fun for you. This thing's on, right? You guys are still out there. Okay, good. Whew. It's a quiet class tonight. So, Shays Rebellion was a bunch of farmers in Massachusetts with really not more than pitchforks and sticks and stones challenging the authority of the state of Massachusetts. Here's how. We're in an agrarian society, right? An agriculturally based society. We talked about that in the economy under last seminar question. And you have your farmers who should be tilling the soil right, and producing crops who are off fighting, just like in the English Civil War. But the farmers have responsibilities at home. They have farms. They have families. They need to maintain their livelihood while they're off serving their country in the, in the Continental Army. So what they do is, based on the promise of the states, in this case Massachusetts, to pay them their wages as soldiers, they go into debt, right, to keep their families, bodies, and souls together. As an example, John Adams, right, second president of the United States, vice president to George Washington, ambassador to England, 
John Adams' wife, Abigail Adams, had to sell pins, pins, in order to make enough money to keep her family fed while John Adams was serving his country in, in this instance um, of Continental Congress. Right? And so these soldiers in Massachusetts are indebting themselves based on the promise that the state of Massachusetts will reimburse them, will pay them for their service. Well, Massachusetts itself is going into default. Massachusetts can't pay its soldiers after the Revolutionary War. The debt is too high. But if we go back to Locke, right, John Locke, one of the main purposes of government is to uphold contracts in law. Remember from our core principles, the idea of contracts in law? And if a soldier, a private individual, goes into debt then and defaults on the debt, isn't it the job of the central government to enforce that contract? So the central government then is going after the farmers, forcing them to sell their farms, forcing them to sell their equipment, even putting them in debtor's prison. Are you guys familiar with debtor's prison? Now today we have, you know, uh, chapter 13, we have bankruptcy. And there are ways to get out of debt. There's a structured mechanism available. In 1788, they picked you up and they threw you into debtor's prison until you paid your debt. Now you think, Mike, this is, this is antithetical because if you're in prison, you can't earn a living. Exactly. You're in prison and so you're going to do everything you can to pay your debt, whether it's going to your father-in-law or going to your mother or selling your farm, whatever it takes to get the money to get you out of debt. Otherwise, you're just going to rot in prison, right? So it's really, a, it's really a driving force to get you to pay your debt. Well, wait a minute, though. They're landing in debtor's prison. They're being forced to sell their farms because they had served the state. It was the state that defaulted. That's irregardless. That may be the cause, but it's still true that they are indebted and they owe their debtors money. So you can see where this bunch of farmers got their pitchforks and their sticks and their boards and their rocks and went and stopped the circuit court in the state of Massachusetts from sitting. The circuit court was the court that was finding these farmers against these farmers and forcing them to sell their farms. So they stopped this mob Shays' Rebellion, Daniel Shays was the leader, stopped the circuit court from sitting. They were successful. Next stop, the courthouse in Springfield, Massachusetts, because it's the courthouse where they keep the records, the contracts. If there are no contracts, is there, if there is no record of indebtedness, there is no indebtedness. Off they go to the courthouse. Next stop, the armory. All right, enough with these pitchforks and sticks. Let's get some guns. And off they go to the armory. George Washington and the Continental Congress is sitting in Philadelphia, and they can't move. There is no centralized authority under the Articles of Confederation to allow them to put down this domestic insurrection. The state of Massachusetts has only its little militia, a very poor militia. Eventually, they do put down the uprising, but it took quite a bit of oomph to put it down because the very people they were relying on to put it down were the people who were rebelling. You see the problem here. So, Shays' Rebellion at one time, and then at the next, or at the same time, roughly, you have the Annapolis Convention. So, Annapolis, Maryland, when the 13 states got together to talk about the problems they were experiencing under the Articles of Confederation. Primarily, first, that there were trade skirmishes between states, armed skirmishes, smuggling between states. There were pressure from Britain to pay the pre- and post-war debt. And so Britain was pressuring. There were pressures from within, economic pressures, um, actually armed conflict. You know, we have this concept that after the Revolutionary War, the states were a very cohesive, agreeable family, right? And they just marched off arm in arm, arm, in arm into the future, right? Nothing less true could be the case. There were actually armed battles between the states under the Articles of Confederation. So at the Annapolis Convention, meant to hammer out some of the problems of the Articles of Confederation, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton 
saw an opportunity and they basically hijacked the convention to force the question using Shays' Rebellion as an example of the unfitness of the Articles of Confederation to control domestic tranquility, to provide for the common defense, those things that it was meant to do that it was failing. Problem was, the delegates at the Annapolis Convention were only given the authority to talk about the Articles of Confederation. They weren't authorized to talk about a new constitution. And so they had to disband the Annapolis Convention and agree to go back to their state legislatures and come back one more time for the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia in 1787. To further the timeline, Congress affirmed the Constitution September 17, 1787. It sent it to the states for ratification on September 28th. Ratification was announced by Congress following the ratification of the Ninth State, New Hampshire, uh, in June 1788. And then Congress, then the other four states added on. Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, adjourned, and the new House of Representatives convened under the new Constitution on April 1st, 1789. All right, so now we understand what the impetus was to create the new constitution, the abject failure of the Articles of Confederation, Shays' Rebellion, armed skirmishes between the states, the Annapolis Convention, finally leading us to the Constitutional Convention. So then, what is this constitution? I would really encourage you to follow along in your book. In my book, the Constitution follows chapter 2, and it begins on page 64, and this is in American Government and Politics Today, Bards et al. And so we see the structure roughly to be the preamble, Article 1, which establishes the legislature, Article 2, that establishes the executive, Article 3, the judiciary, Article 4, relations among the states. We'll talk about all these. Article 5, how to amend the Constitution, the mechanisms to amend it. Article 6 talks about the supremacy clause. And Article 7, finally, talks about ratification, how we ratify this thing. OK, so then we start with the preamble. We, the people of the United States, you know this by heart, right? In order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, Shays' Rebellion, provide for the common defense, no centralized army, to promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Now, remember that our founding generation are well-schooled in rhetoric. And so there's subtleties in even just this preamble that set the principles of the Age of Enlightenment. They're the furtherance of the Declaration of Independence. To secure the blessings of liberty. What are the blessings of liberty? You guys, what are the blessings of liberty? What would you imagine? You're doing it, right? Self-improvement, owning property, gathering property, living life to its fullest, becoming the best person you can be, all those elements of the social contract that Hobbes talked about, art and letters and navigation and, and, and crafts and building and... Ah. Pursuit of happiness. Right, the pursuit of happiness, exactly. And so to secure these blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, I had a question you know, the other night I never signed on to the social contract. I never agreed as an individual or ratified the Constitution. So how is it that I'm beholden to it? How is it that I'm still a part of it? Well, because you're taking advantage of the things that are being provided. Exactly. And if you don't try to change it, if you don't try to actively do away with it, you're, in effect, agreeing to live under it. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. You're right. Now, they use the words to ordain and establish. Now, this is an odd rhetorical flourish, wouldn't you think? Are they simply being redundant? Doesn't that mean the same thing, to ordain and establish? Of course not, right? To establish is to create the law. You establish a law. Ordain, what does that mean? What is ordination? Anybody? 
You've heard this word, to ordain. Mm -hmm. A little bit, little bit more than just bless. Ju to bless. Thank you. Okay, so you have ordination of a priest. Let's say it's to set it aside, to make it sacred. And so they're imbuing this constitution with a sense of destiny. Right? Now, this isn't in a religious context, but it is in a higher form of thinking. It is to ordain this constitution. It is to set it above and beyond for ages into the future. Right? Not just to establish it, but to make it something special, something apart and separate. So another key element is starting off with we the people. If you see the original drafts, this started out with the United States of America. Again, they were going with that state identity. And you can see in George Washington's draft of the Constitution, and it's online, I'll show you where it is, where they crossed out the United States and put in we the people. This is evidence of being a republic, right? It's being ordained by the people, not by the states, not by the elite, but by the people themselves. Excellent. Okay. So let's go over the structure of the Constitution, not to the point of putting you to sleep, right, but to introduce some of the core concepts that we're going to be looking at. We'll be coming back to the Constitution many times during the next... 10 weeks, right? We're going to be looking at the legislature in chapter 10, the presidency in chapter 11, the judiciary in chapter 13. So we'll be coming back to each one of these individually. For tonight, I just want to introduce you to where they are and what some of the elements are. You coming along with me? Yes? Okay. Good. So, section 1, article 1, section 1. All legislative powers herein granted are vested in a Congress of the United States, which will consist of a Senate and a House of Representatives. Section 2 talks about the House of Representatives specifically. Clause 1, the composition and election of members, qualifications of members, the apportionment of representatives and direct taxes, what happens when you have to fill a vacancy, what about the officers, and what about impeachment of members. Section 3 talks about the Senate, the term, and the number of members classifications of senators, their qualifications. What about the role of the vice president of the United States as president of the Senate? Clause 4, and other officers. Clause 5, impeachment trials. The 6th, and penalties for conviction. Clause 7. Section 4, congressional elections. So building in the time, place, and manner restrictions called for when electing Congress. So Clause 1, the elections, sessions of Congress, then Section 5, the powers and duties of the houses, admitting members and a quorum, rules and discipline of members, keeping a record, when they can adjourn, how they adjourn. Section 6, the rights of the members, their compensation and privileges, any restrictions on the members. Section 7, legislative powers, bills and resolutions, um, revenue bills, first one out of the gate the presidential veto, the role of the presidential veto, and then actions on other matters. My favorite, we'll be coming back to this a number of times, is Section 8. These are called the enumerated powers of Congress. Enumerated, they're numbered. They're actually listed, the powers of Congress. First one out of the gate, you guys are following along, taxation. We learn from the Articles of Confederation, the first power of Congress, straight out of the gate, no equivocation, the power to tax. Boom, there it is the power to borrow money, the power to regulate commerce in and amongst the states. What about naturalization and bankruptcy? Money and standards. Okay, so you guys, bear with me here for a moment, but we just covered four that are huge and have been a huge part of our national conversation in the last three or four years. And this is the C, this is where those powers come from. For example, you've heard about the debt ceiling, right? That Congress can't borrow any more money. You know, it's at the debt ceiling. And if they don't raise the debt ceiling, then, well, we go into sequestration. We go, the government goes broke. We're not able to pay our bills. You've heard this, right, in the news. You've heard some of this going on. 
That's not in the Constitution. The debt ceiling is a self-imposed limit on Congress by Congress. Clause 2 of Section 8 says, to borrow money on the credit of the United States. There is no limit. There is no limit. That's a self-imposed restriction. The regulation of commerce. How many people in here have a cell phone? Okay. How many people know where the home uh, state of the corporation that runs your service provider is? I rest my case. So every time you pick up your phone and invoke it, send a text, call somebody, check Facebook, whatever it is you're doing, right? You're spending money, right? You have that phone because you're spending money. You have a plan, right? So if you, so much as a penny crosses state lines, Congress has the authority to insert itself into that conversation. Into, not the conversation that you're having, into the mechanism by which that company offers its services and you pay for your services. Congress has the enumerated power to regulate that commerce. So, one of the key ideals to the enumerated powers is that they're very vague. To regulate commerce, that's huge. Right? And you can imagine that a million and one examples have come down the pike where you would say, well, Congress has the power to regulate commerce, and so it must be okay. Can I give you an example? You guys will enjoy this. The Gun-Free Zone Act. A couple of years ago, Congress came up with a law that established a gun-free zone around K-12 through schools. And it was challenged, obviously, by the people who support the Second Amendment. The authority of Congress to impose a gun-free zone, a, a geographic radius around a school, let's say two miles or five miles, right, around a school, was found to be unconstitutional. They asked Congress what the power was, what authority by which they established that gun-free zone act. You want to know their answer? The Commerce Clause. You want to know how? This is really kind of clever if you think about it. Here's their argument. Little Johnny and Little Jane is going to school, right? Let's say they're in fourth grade. If Little Johnny and Little Jane know that there is a gun-free zone around their school, they'll feel more safe. This is the federal government's justification. Can't make this stuff up. They'll feel more safe. If they feel more safe, they'll do better in school. If they do better in school, chances are they'll go on to higher education. If they go on to higher education, their earning capability for their lifetime will be exponentially greater. If they earn more money over their lifetime, it improves the economy. If it improves the economy, you're talking about commerce. And Congress has the authority to regulate commerce. That was their argument. I'm not saying I'm not on either side. I don't care. You know, I'm talking about the mechanics. So this is an interpretation of a very broad, sweeping power that the court stepped in and said, mm, yeah, not so much. What about naturalization? Naturalization is how you become a citizen. It doesn't talk about immigration. Immigration isn't part of the Constitution. Immigration was welcome in 1788. They were hoping for immigration. Even they weren't even thinking of restricting immigration in 1788, right? So where does the federal government get the power to limit or to even address immigration? It's not an enumerated power. Again, they hearken it to the regulation of commerce clause because allowing immigrants in is affecting the workforce, which is affecting commerce. Anybody know what time it is? Anybody? Five to seven. Who says? According to the atomic clock. The atomic clock. Okay, great. Says, com says Congress. Right. To set the standards of weights and measures, and to, uh, well, to coin money to regulate the value thereof and, to, and a foreign coin, and to fix the standards of weights and measures. Time is a measure. Congress has the legitimate enumerated power to tell us what time it is. And they're the ones who authorize the atomic clock. You think I'm kidding? Daylight savings time. 
right? Now it's 6 o'clock, now it's 7 o'clock because it's a different calendar day, right? How did that happen? Congress has the power to tell us what time it is. Huge powers, right? Not to crying it, but this is where that power originates. What about punishing counterfeiters, post offices and post roads, patents and copyrights? To establish lower courts, when we get to Article 3, Article 3 establishes the Supreme Court and other courts that Congress can from time to time ordain. Lower courts, punishment for piracy. What about the declaration of war? Article 1, Section 8, Clause 11. To declare war. When was the last time we had a declaration of war? 1941. World War II. The Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Korea, Vietnam, Bosnia, Gulf War, Iraqi freedom. Right? Those are all subsequent to 1941, yes? And so what you have then is Congress making resolutions in support of presidential actions or not to raise an army, creation of a navy, the regulation of the armed forces, the militia, how the militia is organized, the creation of the District of Columbia, and finally, the elastic clause. You guys know what a loophole is? You've heard the term a loophole, right? So I would argue that the regulation of commerce clause is a loophole of power for Congress through which you can drive a tractor trailer, right? one of those big Mack trucks. If that's the case, then the elastic clause, clause 18, is a loophole through which you can drive a nuclear aircraft carrier. It is so big. What it says is to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. May I give you an example? Establishing a Bank of the United States. So Alexander Hamilton, under George Washington's administration, helped create a national bank. Now, nowhere in these enumerated powers does it say you can create a bank. And sure enough, a guy named McCulloch sued, saying you don't have that authority. The Jeffersonian Republicans, the Anti-Federalists, hated the idea of a national bank. They thought it was too much power. The Supreme Court came out in a, in a very important decision that said, no, they can, by virtue of the Elastic Clause, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for the carrying into execution the foregoing powers. So if you have to raise and support an army and navy and build post offices and post roads and collect taxes and set the standards of weights and measures and deal with bankruptcy and naturalization. You can't do this out of a desk. You need a bank. You need an institution, said Hamilton. The Supreme Court agreed, finding that power in the elastic clause, the necessary and proper clause. Section 9, the powers denied to Congress. Section 10, the powers denied to the states. All right. So a good way of examining the legislature under Article I is to look at the main compromises during the Constitutional Convention, which is part of your seminar question, right? So here we go. The first and foremost was the Connecticut Compromise or the Great Compromise. Now, this is an issue about proportionate representation in Congress. That's what is driving it. It almost hamstrung the Constitutional Convention. It almost ended the Constitutional Convention. It was that divisive. What you're talking about is a severe disagreement between the large states and the small states. So here's how. The New Jersey plan was to come together and simply improve the Articles of Confederation so that they were equal to the task, so that they can get the job done. In other words, perhaps give Congress the power to tax. Perhaps give Congress a more centralized authority, but not too much, but to keep government the same. Why would New Jersey, which is a small state, want to keep things the same? Because in a unicameral legislature where New Jersey has the same weight as Virginia, duh, it serves the small states to go with the New Jersey plan. So all the small states wanted the New Jersey plan. The large states wanted the Virginia plan. The Virginia plan is credited to James Madison, the father of the Constitution, who had done his homework and with some other Virginians had gotten to Philadelphia a couple of weeks prior to the Constitutional Convention 
and drew up this series of 15 resolutions to create a new system of government, this constitution. But here was his original plan to have two chambers, the first, the lower chamber, to be elected by the population as a whole, by the electorate, on a proportionate level. So if in Virginia, let's say you have, I don't know, these are just rough numbers, right? 40% of the population of the United States live in Virginia. Roughly then, 40% of the representation in the lower chamber would be Virginians. If you have 10% of the population in New Jersey, then 10% of the representation in the lower chamber would be from New Jersey. It's no surprise that the large states wanted the Virginia plan because that gave them more oomph, more voting power in the lower chamber. But here's the really tricky part. The upper chamber is elected from the lower chamber, voting on a slate of candidates provided by the state legislatures. So again, if you have 40% of the lower chamber Virginians and maybe 30% New Yorkers and 20% Pennsylvanians or Massachusetts, right, and the rest of them from the smaller states, the upper chamber is going to have the same proportionate representation, where 40% of the upper chamber are going to be Virginians. No, it's not going to work. And as I said, it almost stymied the Constitutional Convention. The Connecticut Compromise was created when the committee as a whole the Continental Congress formed what they called the Grand Committee, or a single committee to address the issue of the nature, the, the representative nature of Congress. And this is the compromise that they came up with. The lower chamber would be proportionate to the number of free inhabitants in the, each state, plus three-fifths of the slaves, and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then the upper house would have two members from each state elected by their state legislatures. Madison, of all people, in the end, saw the wisdom of this because he saw that the states had a representation in addition to the people in Congress. So what you have is the lower chamber, the House of Representatives, that is proportionately representative of the population. So yeah, if you have 40% of the population in Virginia, you have 40% of the lower chamber from Virginia. But in the upper chamber, it's more reminiscent of the Continental Congress, where each state has, well, in this case, two votes. Now, the delegation is two people, but each senator can vote individually. For example, Massachusetts, during the Constitutional Convention, had a divided delegation. And so they negated their vote because they weren't able to agree, to agree as a delegation. New York, in the Constitutional Convention, had three delegates, two of whom chose not to show up, leaving poor Alexander Hamilton there alone, but because they didn't have a quorum or two-thirds, they weren't able to vote. So New York wasn't in on the vote. In the upper chamber, then, the states are represented because the, state, the senators are selected, elected by, not the people originally, but by the state legislature. Imagine that they aren't elected by us, the people in the state of California, rather by our state assembly and our state senate in Sacramento. To whom are they beholden for their office? Not the people, the legislature. So this is the genius of the Connecticut Compromise originally, that the lower chamber is representative of the people. We have popular election of the representatives. The upper chamber is representative of the state, the state entities. Yeah? And so even Madison got this genius once it was proposed because now you have pluralism expanded exponentially because now you have both the population and the states represented in a bicameral legislature. So here you have Virginia, right? And the idea is inhabit free inhabitants of the state. But Virginia has a large slave-owning population, right? There's a lot of slaves in Virginia. Not a lot of slaves in the smaller northern states. So Virginia, if you're looking at proportionate representation, wants to count the slaves as population. We're not talking about giving them the vote. That's not even what we're talking about here. We're talking about counting noses. 
if Virginia has 40% of the population of the United States of white free inhabitants, but they have 50% of the population, if you bring in everybody, including the slaves, then, according to Virginia, they should have 50% of the representation in the lower chamber. You should include the slaves as population. The northern states, the smaller states, were aghast. They didn't have slaves, so this just meant that the, the juggernaut, the super large states, would only be that much more powerful in the lower chamber. What was the compromise? Three-fifths. A slave would count as three-fifths of a person. Now, I had asked myself a few years ago, where the heck did they come up with three-fifths? Was it a half? It wasn't a quarter? It wasn't a third? You know where it comes from? They looked at the GDP of the United States as a whole and looked at the slave-owning states and their contribution to the GDP, the gross domestic product, the economic output of the nation as a whole, and decided that the slave-owning states put forward three-fifths of the economic output. And so they, it was based on an economic model that the value of the slaves vis-a-vis -vis the value of not having slaves was three-fifths. And so it was a three-fifths compromise, three-fifths of a person, or three-fifths of the population that they finally could settle on, that that was a reasonable compromise. But this also brings up the question of slavery, which is our third compromise. You'll note that in the prohibited powers of Congress, in Section 9, they can't talk about slavery for 20 years, until 1808. Why? This was Benjamin Franklin's idea. The Constitution's ratification wasn't a done deal, by any means, and I'll talk about that. It was kind of fraught. It, it was barely going to get passed as it was, if that. There was a lot of concern. If you tried to abolish slavery, you would have lost all the slave owning states like that. It wouldn't have ever gotten off. So this idea of not talking about slavery, prohibiting Congress from talking about slavery for 20 years, was intended to give it legs, to give the Constitution and the new government legs, to let it get established, let it find its way, and then in 20 years we'll revisit the conversation. So the three compromises met by the drafters in the actual Constitutional Convention around the legislature, legislature was the Great Compromise, right? the balance between the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan, the Three-Fifths Compromise, and the compromise about slavery, the prohibition of talking about slavery. So we've spent, what, 40 minutes now talking about Article I. There's a lot of grist for the mill. There's a lot that the Founding Fathers had to say in Article I. So now you're ready for Article II? This is going to be deceptively simple. Section one, the nature and scope of presidential power. Aha. For your term, choosing the electors of each state and then the former system of, of election. So the electoral college we'll be talking about was pretty much an abject failure. And in, Artic in uh, Amendment 12, we're going to correct it. And so Clause 2 and Clause 3 are actually going to be replaced by the 12th Amendment. And then the time of elections and the qualifications, qualifications that they have to be, the president has to be 35, either a natural born citizen or a citizen at the time of the ratification of the Constitution, and 14 years a resident of the United States. That's it. What's missing? Any property test, any educational test, any religious test. You can be any religion. You can have any amount of wealth or be any amount of poor, right? There is no gender test. There is no um, racial test. Age, you're a citizen, and you've lived here for 14 years. That's it. And they did that intentionally. Remember the 1689 Act of Settlement and all the tests that they wove into that before you could be king? This is pluralism whatever the people decide. The secession of the vice president, the president's salary, and the oath of office to protect and defend the Constitution of the United States. And that's it for Section 1. Section 2, the powers of the president. Ah, here we go. Commander-in-chief to hammer out treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate and to make appointments with the advice and consent of the Senate. 
and filling vacancies. Oh. That's it. Commander in chief, treaties and appointments, and filling vacancies. The duties of the president, ah, from time to time, give Congress a report of the State of the Union to receive ambassadors and take care that laws be faithfully executed. And then impeachment. How we get rid of this guy. Do you see the difference? The founding generation gave Article I and the legislature an insane amount of power. A very, it's a, a limited, uh, uh, come on, like a very expansive, enumerated list. Regulate commerce, huge. Necessary and proper clause, huge. The president, commander in chief, treaties and appointments with the advice and consent of the Senate, fill vacancies. Wow, significantly different. So, what the heck is going on? What were the main compromises that had to be met under Article 2? There are also three. First, the Electoral College. How do we elect this guy? So you're aware, right, that we don't have the popular election of the president. It's a misnomer. We don't elect the president. We, the electorate, don't. We have an electoral college, a mechanism, an institution that exists to elect the president on our behalf. We don't live in a democracy. We live in a constitutional republic. And the Electoral College is evidence of that. It's the rule of law. How we came up with that Electoral College, I'll be talking about in Chapter 8. So hang on. Triumvirate versus one person. The term triumvirate is a $10 word. It means a three-person presidency. So two of the three people would have to agree in order to affect, in order to execute anything. So the Founding Fathers considered this. Why? They were so deathly afraid of power coalescing into this one person. It was their main fear. Why? The historical inheritance, right? Why we yammered on and on about the kings and queens of England and power and lust for power and strangling princes in their bed and, and, and starvation and poisoning and remember, right? This is how. We're afraid of one person in this position. There's too much potential for abuse. So we'll make it a three person. But you're not going to get anything done. Getting two people out of three to agree on anything is going to be fraught. What they could do is they could envision George Washington as the first president. They couldn't see over the next speed bump, but they could see George Washington as the president. So here's how. George Washington wasn't even convinced that he was going to come to the Constitutional Convention. He was president of the Constitutional Convention. But it wasn't until the last minute that he showed up. James Madison, another Virginian, had been petitioning George Washington to come. George Washington was afraid, one, that this Constitutional Convention wasn't going to fly. It was going to be an embarrassment. And if he added his name to it, his name would be embarrassed along with it. Two, he wasn't quite sure of the outcome. He wasn't sure that he wanted his name attached to whatever shenanigans was going on in the Constitutional Convention. So George Washington is a figure that's seen as allowing gravitas, gravity, right, and seriousness to the proceedings. So when he showed up, James Madison was over the moon, right, thrilled that he had showed up. What is it then about George Washington that allowed them to see him as president? Has anybody ever heard the story of how George Washington resigned his commission from the Continental Army. Okay. So bear with me. You probably tell it better than I do. But there's a protocol when one is introduced to a king or to a monarch. You enter the room, right, in the presence, and you bow. You come halfway up to the presence. You stop, and you bow again. And you come finally to the presence, and you bow and you wait to be called out of your bow by the presence, by the monarch. Okay. This is the protocol. It's generally accepted. This is what you do. George Washington was ushered into the Continental Congress. He came to resign his commission as commander-in-chief of the Continental Army. Check. The Revolutionary War is over. The man's retiring. He's going back to Mount Vernon to, to do his farmer thing, right? And so he carries a sword. And to an officer, a sword is your symbol of commission. It is your symbol of martial authority, of power. So he's carrying his sword, not in his scabbard, but like this. 
he walks into the presence, into the Congress. The president is seated up on the DS, right, which is nothing more than a desk on a little platform if you've ever been to Independence Hall in Philadelphia. He walks in, he bows. He walks up again halfway, he bows. He finally reaches the DS, he bows. And he lays his sword at the foot of the desk. So what does this tell us? Well, we remember, this is George Washington, the commander in chief of the Continental Army. This is the most powerful man, the most powerful individual, you could argue, in colonial America, right? And he is voluntarily giving up power, not just resigning his commission, but he's acknowledging the authority, the sovereignty of the representative model, extant in Congress, or, or eminent in Congress, manifest in Congress, by treating Congress as a sovereign, as a monarch. You follow? This is the George Washington they can see in this position. They couldn't see beyond him, but they could see George Washington. And they trusted him that in his first term, he would set precedent and create the office necessary to go on into the future. It was a gamble. They were gambling on the person of George Washington, and it worked. How do we get rid of this guy? Well, the first language was originally good behavior, that the president served during good behavior. This is a low threshold, right? Who gets to define good behavior? Well, if Congress is the one that's impeaching the president, then Congress gets to define it, right? So in other words, it's a very low threshold. If Congress is displeased with the president, impeachment is pretty easy. But then the president is beholden to Congress for their job. And he'll only want to please Congress, and Congress has that authority to oust him so easily. He's supposed to represent the people, not kowtow to Congress. So there has to be a balance, right? So they raise the threshold of impeachment to conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. And treason is going to be defined in Article 3. So these are the three major compromises in Article 2, the executive. I don't have major compromises for Article 3, the judicial branch. We'll talk about that when we talk about Marbury versus Madison, McCulloch versus Maryland in Chapter 13. The three sections talk about the judicial powers, the jurisdiction, or where their powers lay, or to whom, uh, upon whom their powers can be invoked, and defining treason, as I suggested. Article 4 talks about states' relations. We'll talk about this next week when we cover Chapter 3. Full faith and credit, treatment of citizens, admissions of states, and guarantee of a Republican form of government. How do we amend this puppy? As I suggested, two-thirds of both houses and three-fourths of state legislatures. This is the one we always do 27 times. This one we've never done. But this is the one, whenever any form of government becomes destructive these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it. This is the one that's never been invoked. But there it is. The Supremacy Clause. We know that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, but just in case there's any doubt, it's going to say it. Article 7, ratification, how we ratify this country. Okay, so that is the structure of the Constitution. Going from the preamble, we the people, Article 1, the legislature, 2, the presidency, 3, the judiciary, and on down. Madison and Madison's fear of factions. So... Madison is known as the father of our Constitution mainly because he was the driving force behind the Virginia Resolutions, right? That plan that formed the basis of the new system of government in the Constitution. He was also the secretary of the Constitutional Convention, so most of the notes that we have of the deliberations come from Madison. Um, he was, however afraid of what's known as factions within government. A faction is simply a subset of the whole who might hold a distinct idea or a separate idea from the rest. So uh, we have this class as a whole, and obviously there are going to be factions in this class. There are going to be factions of those people who are Red Sox fans and those people who are Yankees fans, right? So that would be a faction of the subset, right? a part of the whole. Well, the same is going to be true if you think about it politically. A faction of Congress today is Republican. A faction is Democrat. A faction of um, 
southern states, a faction of northern states, a faction of people who believe in a strong central government, and a faction of people who believe in a weak central government and strong member states. Really, what we're talking about is his fears being realized through the existence of factions known as the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. So, the Federalists are known through what are called the Federalist Papers. Now, your book talks about the Federalist Papers, there are 85 essays written in the newspapers of the time intended to argue for the ratification of the Constitution. So we're on the road to ratification. The first state that's going to call the question is Pennsylvania, the Keystone State, because their next legislative session would have been a year away, so they wanted to get the question called before their legislature disbanded. So there wasn't a lot of time in Pennsylvania to discuss the pros and cons of the Constitution. It pretty much went immediately to a vote. So they relied on the pre-existing factions of Federalists and Anti-Federalists, knowing that the Federalists would probably win the day. There were two Anti-Federalists who didn't want to cast their votes, didn't want to be seen as being on the wrong side of history, so they hid. They hid in their lodgings. But the state assembly needed a quorum, enough numbers of its members to affect a quorum, or enough people so that a decision made by the lower chamber would be legal, would hold. And so there was actually a mob that went from uh, the state, uh, state house in Philadelphia to roust these people out of their <laughs> beds and carry them through the streets, sit them down in the chamber, and force them to vote. So the ratification process, as I suggested, isn't easy. It's not a done deal. There's a lot of contention and a lot of debate going on. So as the delegates to the Pennsylvania Convention made their way back to their home states, the words engrossed on the four sheets of parchment they had drafted that summer really represented little more than their opinion. They lacked the sanction of the Continental Congress, the state governments, or of the people. By the terms of the proposed Constitution, the new government would take effect when nine of the 13 states deliberating in specially called ratifying conventions, added their assent to the document. This was yet another of the revolutionary provisions of the proposed Constitution, as under the terms of the Articles of Confederation, unanimous approval of all 13 state legislatures was necessary for any amendment to take effect. But, having already made the decision not to amend the Articles, but instead to create an entirely new scheme of government, the framers devised a ratification procedure aimed at avoiding the necessity of unanimous approval. The debate over the proposed Constitution in the individual states really was America's first national referendum, the first time the voters in all the states were asked to express their opinion about a specific subject. Unlike in state or local elections, where multiple candidates and multiple issues could often produce ambiguous results, the decision facing Americans during the ratification debates was a stark one. It was yes or no. The debate over ratification was, first and foremost, a partisan political contest, which is why we're talking about the Federalists, and the Anti-Federalists. In that contest, supporters of the Constitution enjoyed some important advantages. In what could prove a brilliant tactical move, they appropriated the name Federalists from their opponents, <laughs> leaving those who opposed ratification with the unappealing label of Anti-Federalists. In fact, most scholars agree that the true Federalists, in the original meaning of that word, 
were actually the opponents of the Constitution, who continued to believe in a central government of strictly limited powers, operating within the framework of a confederation of independent and sovereign states. Equally important, the Federalists were able to capitalize on a key factor working in their favor, that is, momentum. They immediately sent this proposed Constitution to the Continental Congress and then persuaded the Congress to release the document to the states for their consideration within 11 days of the conventions being adjourned. At that point, supporters of the Constitution, many of whom served in the Constitutional Convention and were already well prepared with arguments defending their actions, stole the initiative from their opponents. Many anti-federalists, though armed at the extent of the changes proposed by the Constitution, had not yet time to formulate coherent arguments against ratification. Between the end of September and January 9th, five states, Delaware, Pennsylvania, as we suggest, New Jersey, Georgia, and Connecticut, had ratified the Constitution. Only in Pennsylvania, as I've just stated, was there really any significant opposition. And even in that state, the superior organizational abilities of the Federalists in particular, their control over the most of the newspapers reporting on the debate of the Constitution, enabled them to prevail in this state ratifying convention by a two-to-one margin. As the Constitution was transmitted to the remaining states, the conventions in those states were confronted not only with the decision about whether or not to adopt the Constitution, but also with the fact that more than half of the necessary nine states already decided to do so. The Federalist Papers actually came after the Anti-Federalist Papers. The Federalists were John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. James Madison wrote the lion's share of the Federalist Papers. But it was actually in response to a series of essays that were already being penned by Patrick Henry, Samuel Adams, Melanchthon Smith, the Anti-Federalists. And so the 85 essays appearing in New York City newspapers under the pseudonym Publius between October of 1787 and May of 1788 were later published under this single collection called the Federalist Papers. And... As a collection, they have achieved justifiable fame as an important statement of American constitutional philosophy. And so, as I suggest, Alexander Hamilton took the lead first, recruiting James Madison and John Jay to join him in the effort. In all, Hamilton wrote 51 of the essays, Madison wrote 29, and John Jay wrote 5. So the essays were written independently with little collaboration among the three authors. Indeed, they were written under such constraints that there was seldom time for review, really, or for revision. Looking at the Federalist Papers then as a whole, one can see that Madison tended to write his essays on general issues of government and politics, on republicanism and representation in particular, while Hamilton focused on specific issues, such as taxation, or the construction of the executive and the judiciary. It is perhaps for that reason that Madison's essays, though constituting only about a third of the total, are the ones that are often most quoted and reprinted. The Federalist Papers have grown more influential over time and have come to be considered an important means of understanding the intent of the framers of the Constitution, or as we suggest, founders' intent. In the period between 1790 and 1800, when the leaders of the New Republic were facing the challenge of creating a government that conformed to the precepts of their new Constitution, the Federalists, the original published collection containing 77 of the essays, was cited by the Supreme Court. In the whole of the 19th century, the essays were cited 58 times. In the first half of the 20th century, they were cited 38 times, but in the last half, they were cited no fewer than 194 times. However much the Federalist Papers may have on some occasion risen to the level of high-minded political theory, we in this class should also be aware 
that they were initially intended as political propaganda, right? So Madison and Hamilton, whatever their intellectual gifts, were also practical politicians with a specific goal, right? To secure ratification of the Constitution. So in that sense, the Federalist Papers, like the Constitution they were defending, need to be understood not merely as abstract constitutional treatises, but also as the product of a give and take of the turbulent era of the 18th century and 18th century American politics. The Federalist Papers are 85 essays written at the time of the ratification of the Constitution in support of the strong central government, written by John Jay, Alexander Hamilton, and James Madison. There, you have the definition. But that's the easy part. Why are they significant? The Federalist Papers are significant in five distinct ways. One, they show evidence that this is a Republican form of government being born. Noam Chomsky and other revisionist historians, contemporary historians, argue that the Constitution was a system of government created by the elite and for the elite and was imposed on an unsuspecting populace. That's a reasonable, reasonable argument. My counter-argument is this is evidence of a Republican form of government because the Federalists are actually publishing the papers, the essays, in the newspapers of the time. They're coming to the people through the newspapers, arguing in 85 distinct essays for the powers in the Constitution, arguing <coughs> for the Constitution. If it's a fait accompli, if it's a done deal of the elite, by the elite, for the elite, there would be no need to go to the people. There would be no reason to try to convince the general population to support the Constitution. So the existence, the very existence of the Federalist Papers argues that this is a Republican form of government. Sovereignty rests with the people. They're convincing the people. Two, it's evidence of pluralism in the ratification debate, which again flies in the face of this elite, by the elite, for the elite. As I'll go through the titles here in a minute, there are three times when the Federalists not only acknowledge the existence of the anti-federalists in the essays, they actually take what the anti-federalists are saying, are arguing, present those arguments in the federalist papers, and then provide a counter-argument for it. So they're not ignoring what the anti-federalists are saying, or even that the anti-federalists exists. Quite the contrary. They're taking what the anti-federalists say and answering them in a public forum. So the Federalist Papers are evidence of pluralism. The Federalist Papers are the horse's mouth, their founder's intent. We have 85 essays telling us exactly what the founding fathers meant when they talked about the separation of powers, when they talked about conformity to Republican principles, when they talked about the insufficiency of the present confederation to preserve the union, when they talked about the structure of government furnishing the proper checks and balances, 85 topics where they're telling us exactly what their thinking is, what their logic is in creating the system of government, right? And we're trying to ascertain, okay, what did they mean when they gave judges life tenure? It's one of the main criticisms of the judiciary that once judges are seated, they have life tenure. That during, you know, unless impeached for treason or high, other high crimes and misdemeanors, they aren't accountable to the public voice. They're not. Intentionally, how do we know? They written, they've written essays telling us. Now, this isn't to say that we have to be lockstep with the founding generation. Our political system has evolved. 240 years, we've evolved, right? But in order to understand what they meant, you have to have founders' intent. To get founders' intent, you go to the Federalist Papers. That makes sense? So evidence of a Republican form of government, 
evidence of pluralism at the time, founders' intent. Four, this is the birth of the two parties, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists are going to turn into the Whigs, and the Whigs are going to, well, become uh, pretty weak and actually disappear in the face of the question on abolition and the Civil War. The Anti-Federalists are going to turn into the Jeffersonian Republicans, are going to turn into the Stonewall Jackson, the Jacksonian Democrats, are going to turn into the Democrats. The Republican Party that we have today is actually born in the Civil War from disenfranchised Whigs, W-H-I-G-S, Whigs, which was the Federalists, and uh, pro-abolitionist uh, Jacksonian Democrats. So you have, in the Federalist Papers, the birth of the two parties. And again, the idea that reasonable people can disagree. You'll see that there isn't name calling. There isn't um, meanness. We're talking about ideas and how a government should be formed. And it's very high toned. There's not personal attacks in here. We're talking about an idea. Fifth, the Federalist Papers give birth to the Bill of Rights the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. Here's how. The Federalists and the Anti-Federalists had such a conversation that the Anti-Federalists were holding sway. And they were convincing the population that this Constitution needed some thinking. The best protection against it was to create a Bill of Rights. It was actually introduced at the last minute on September 17th in the Constitutional Convention by a delegate from... Massachusetts, to create a Bill of Rights. But it wasn't until after the Constitution was ratified, the first job of the new Congress would be to create the Bill of Rights, the first 10 amendments. So the existence of the Federalist, Anti-Federalist debate resulted in the Bill of Rights. So again, we have our definition, right? And now we have five key elements of significance. All right. So then what are these 85 essays? Well, I got the titles right here to give us just an idea. We don't have to remember every one. This is just to give us a sense. So the Union is a safeguard against domestic faction and insurrection. Remember Shays' Rebellion? The consequences of hostilities between the states, those armed skirmishes. Objection to the proposed constitution from the extent of territory? Answer. This is the anti-federalists. These were, this is what the anti-federalists are saying, and this is our answer. The insufficiency of the present confederation to preserve the union. That's the one that I read from, right? Uh, the other defects of the present confederation, the articles of confederation. The power of taxation, the difficulties of the convention in devising a proper form of government, republic, uh, conformity to republican principles, uh, the powers of a convention to form a mixed government examined and sustained. The alleged danger of the, from the powers of the union to state governments considered. The influence of the state and federal governments compared. Uh, methods of guarding against the encroachments of any one department of government by appealing to the people through a convention. Periodic appeals to the people considered. The structure of the government must furnish the proper checks and balances. The House of Representatives, the Senate, the Judiciary the executive department, the command of the military and the armed forces, the treaty-making power of the executive. You can see 85 essays going in great detail, one by one, the points of the Constitution. Then number 84 again, the anti-federalists are saying, and this is our answer, and then concluding remarks. Excellent. So the Federalist Papers, we're going to be reading from now, from this point, until the end of this semester. You'll be hearing a lot of these because, again, they show founders' intent. So the anti-federalist response. Again, these guys aren't bad guys. They just happen to be on the other side of a philosophic idea. For example, I give you Samuel Adams, Patrick Henry, Melanchthon Smith. These guys, you know, this is give me liberty or give me death. This is... 
Samuel Adams, a patriot, John Adams' cousin, that they weren't at the Constitutional Convention. This doesn't make them bad guys. Neither was Thomas Jefferson, nor was John Adams. Right? They were ambassadors. They were out of the country at the time. Patrick Henry, though, did it intentionally. He didn't want his name muddy, just like George Washington, with the shenanigans going on in this Constitutional Convention. Have you ever heard the term or the uh, saying, I smell the rat? That was Patrick Henry talking about the Constitutional Convention. I smelt a rat. He didn't go. He didn't want to go. So what were the anti-federalists saying? I'm not going to give you all 85 of theirs, but I'm going to give you four that I think will give you pause. The new Constitution creates a national government, but it will not abate foreign influence. It won't control foreign influence. Adoption of the Constitution will lead to civil war. Hmm. Federalist power will ultimately subvert state authority. And the use of coercion by the new government. They had some points. They had some points. And it was well stood that they were in the conversation, that they were participating in the conversation, because as I've suggested, it's going to create that balance necessary that's going to create the Bill of Rights. So our next Federalist paper that I'd like to read to you from is Federalist number 51. This is the Madisonian model. Now, I have an exercise for you. You guys ready? In your textbook, I want you to go into the index, which in my book is on page I-18, and find where it says the Madisonian model or the Madison model. You'll see it shows page 46 and page 47, right? So now I want you to go to page 46, where it says the Madisonian model, a structure of government proposed by James Madison in which the powers of government are separated into three branches, the executive, the legislative, and the judicial. You see where I am at? Everybody? Okay, page 46. Everybody's got their book, right? All right. That's fine. So what, that's why I suggest you go to the index and find the Madisonian model. Okay. What I want you to do is to make note in your book, whether you do it in the margin or on a piece of paper and stick it in there if you don't want to write on your book, if you want to resell it, that's fine, I get it. What I want you to do is to take Barbara Bard's definition of the Madisonian model and correct it. This is where I say, if she and I were in the room, boy, we'd be having at it right now. Because I argue that the Madisonian model includes the states. Folks, this is vitally important and something that I really need to stress. The Madisonian model includes the role of the states and the electorate. If you're looking at the balance of power, the three branches of the national government surely are part of the Madisonian model, but they are not the sum total. The role of the states and the role of the electorate is just as important, just as equally vital to the health of a balanced power system. The role of the states in balancing the government. I give you the Voting Rights Act. I give you medical marijuana. I give you euthanasia. I give you same-sex marriage. Any of these important societal issues that we're talking about today, they rise from the states, and they challenge the national government by virtue of the states' rights in the federal system. To leave the states out of the Madisonian model is a disservice. Now, the key is, this is the government proposed by James Madison. The state's rights in the federal government are established by the Connecticut Compromise. So, although it wasn't James Madison's model, it's a part of the Madisonian model in that it's the structure of balance of power in the Constitution. So, there's that. Thank you for allowing me that. I get so hot because every time we have a discussion at the state's level that directs the federal policymaking process, we forget that they're part of the process. Having said that, I give you Federalist number 51. The structure of the government must furnish the checks and balances between the different departments. But the great security against a gradual concentration of the several powers in the same department consists in giving to those who administer 
each department the necessary constitutional means and personal motives to resist encroachment of others. The provision for defense must, in this, as in all other cases, be made commensurate to the danger of attack. Ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection of human nature that such devices should be necessary to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. In framing a government which is to be administered by men, over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed and, in the next place, oblige it to control itself. So the balance of power, this ambition being made to counteract ambition, is at the heart of the Madisonian model. The seed of the Madisonian model can be found in Montesquieu. So we talked about Montesquieu last week, right, and his spirit of the laws. And I argue that he said in every government there are three sorts of power. The legislative, to create law, to legislate, to make law. The executive, to execute the law, as he says, in respect to things dependent on the law of nations. And then thirdly, the judicial, in regards to things that depend on the civil law. So Madison didn't come up with the idea of separation of powers, hardly. It's something that had been extant for years. Montesquieu talked about it um, 30, 40 years prior to the Constitutional Convention. So I would also argue that classical political philosophers from Aristotle onward favored this type of mixed government, combining elements of monarchy, aristocracy, and some element of democracy. As I said, Montesquieu described it fully in his book, Spirit of Laws. And as we discover next week in Chapter 3, the Madisonian model improved on this by adding the role of the states in the federal system to the balance of power system. So, as I suggested, one of the results of the Federalist-Anti-Federalist debate in the ratification process is the Bill of Rights. So next two weeks, chapter four, we'll be talking about the Bill of Rights. We'll have a whole lecture on this, right? But I want to introduce them to you tonight just to get them under our belt so that we can start breathing them in, right? So I'm going to go through these very quickly, and then I'm also going to go through the remaining 17 amendments just so that we have um, proper context. The Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the Constitution. There are originally 12. One is going to come back as the 27th Amendment, and one is going to be folded in with another. The First Amendment, freedom of religion, speech, press, assembly, and the right to petition Congress for a redress of grievances. What about the Second Amendment, the militia and the right to bear arms? The Third Amendment, addressing the quartering of soldiers, right? The Fourth Amendment, talks about searches and seizures. The Fifth Amendment, grand juries, self-incrimination, double jeopardy, due process of law, and the idea of eminent domain. So have you ever heard the term, I take the fifth? That's what they're talking about, the Fifth Amendment. The Sixth Amendment establishes criminal court procedures. The Seventh Amendment, trial by jury in civil cases hearkening back to Magna Carta in 1215. The Eighth Amendment talks about bail and the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishment. And then Ninth and Tenth are meant to be the stop gaps. If we forgot anything, 
Remember, this is the anti-federalists saying, we want to control the central government. We're afraid of the strong central government. If we forgot anything, remember that all rights are retained by the people. It's a Republican form of government. The rights are the people's, not the government. Governments are instituted to secure the rights that are naturally born into human. Then, the reserve powers to the states. Anything that's not given to the federal government is inherently given to the states. Education, right? So there's a big hoopla um, currently about California and standardized testing. I don't know if you heard about this, but California is going to be doing away with standardized testing and the federal government's throwing a uh, hissy fit because they're saying it's against the law. It's not really against the law. It's against the federal funding that comes. And if we issue, if we give up the federal funding, the federal government has nothing to say about it. They can take their funding and march because the rights are retained by the states. It's a reserve power to the states. It's on us to decide, not the federal government. So that goes right back to the heart of the Tenth Amendment, right? Okay. Then the other 17, just a very broad whirlwind tour. How do you sue a state? How does a private citizen sue a state? The Eleventh Amendment. The election of a president. The election of 1800 between... Thomas Jefferson and John Adams was so messed up, it was so <laughs> uh, keystone cops that they had to redo the electoral college. They had to rethink the way it worked. That's the 12th Amendment. 13, 14, and 15 are the Civil War Amendments. First, the 13th, the prohibition of slavery in 1865. And then citizenship, due process, and equal protection. We'll be talking a lot about that in Chapter 4. Then the right to vote for black men over the age of 21. 16 is established income taxes. It was actually a progressive era reform, and we'll talk about that. Another progressive era reform is the popular election of senators. So it changes that uh, state legislatures electing the Senate and gives it back to the people at large, the popular election of senators. 18, Prohibition was actually a progressive era movement. Yesterday was Jane Addams' 150th birthday. Jane Addams and the Settlement Houses in Chicago, a movement to protect the immigrants from themselves. Americanization programs, surely, but the evils of drink in particular. Right? And women's temperance societies campaigning for prohibition to protect the Hungarians, the Italians, and the Poles, specifically, in the early 1900s from the evils of drink. The women's right to vote we'll be talking about in Chapter 5, 1920. A lame duck. Ever heard this term? A lame duck? What the heck's a lame duck doing in the Constitution? You know what it means? So, the president is elected in November, but doesn't take office until March. And so that's five months of a president who perhaps is seated in the Oval Office who really effectively has no authority because in five months everybody knows he's going to be out on his ear. Then we're going to have a new president, so why the heck should we listen to him? He's effectively sidelined. He's a lame duck. Uh, if you have a duck with a broken leg and he just kind of walks in circles and quacks a lot, that's what the president's <laughs> doing, right? And so we shorten the time and we move the inauguration to early January, cutting off three months of lame duckedness. To repeal prohibition, the heart of the Depression, Franklin Roosevelt said the country needed a beer. The country needed a beer. Well, he was right. He was joking. But he was in earnest because if you're in the heart of a Depression and you need economic vitality, the last thing you want to do is cut off the growth of grains, the manufacturing of alcohol, the distribution of alcohol, the sales of alcohol, the taxes that come with the sales of alcohol, why the heck would you cut off an entire segment of the economy, repeal prohibition? The only amendment that's been repealed. The limitation of president's presidential terms, FDR was elected to an unprecedented four, year, four terms. He died in his fourth term of office, in office. Um, George Washington has set the precedent for two terms. That was the... Uh, tradition, but there were no term limits in the Constitution. Now there are two terms. 
the electors for the District of Columbia, up until 1961, if you lived in Washington, D.C., you couldn't vote for, well, either a representative, a senator, or the president. You know the little mottos on the license plate? Ours used to say Eureka. Pennsylvania has the Keystone, K, Keystone State. Do you know what Washington, D.C.'s was? Taxation without representation. They couldn't vote. This gives them the right to vote for the president or for the electoral college. The anti-poll tax, a civil rights era amendment that prohibited taxing the right to vote. Well, and any other Jim Crow laws that kept a segment of the population away from the polls, away from the voting booth. Literacy tests, grandfather tests, poll taxes. Presidential succession. Following John F. Kennedy's assassination, they wanted it very clear the line of succession. So you have the president, the vice president, the speaker of the house, the president pro tem of the senate, and then the cabinet level officers in the seniority of the departments, not the officer. So the first department was the Department of State, then the Department of Treasury or the Secretary of the Treasury, and then down the, in the seniority of the state departments themselves. The 25th Amendment also got a lot of attention during the Trump administration because it's by virtue of the 25th Amendment that if a president is determined to be mentally, psychologically incapacitated, then a vote of his cabinet level officers would allow him to be removed from office until he had regained his capacity. Of course, it never happened in the Trump administration, but if you remember hearing the 25th Amendment a lot during the administration, this is why. This is where that process lives. The 18-year-old vote. Finally, we have universal suffrage. Universal suffrage means that anybody who is an adult can vote. So up until 1971, you had to be 21. Now, oddly, you could be drafted at 18 and serve in Vietnam and die for your country and not be able to vote. So this just corrected that. Finally, congressional pay. 27th Amendment in 1992, our last amendment. How does Congress give itself a raise? So again, my dear friends, our seminar question. How and why was the Constitution created? What are the main features of the government under the Constitution? What conflicts emerged first during the writing of the Constitution and later during the ratification debate? And as I promised at the beginning of class, remember we need a strong thesis statement. From that comes a well-constructed outline, allows for fearless editing, and gives us a springboard for a strong conclusion. We're going to tell them we're going to tell them, we're going to tell them we're going to tell them we're told them, right? So here's how. My crack at a thesis statement. The main features of the United States Constitution comma, including its system of checks and balances, a firm foundation on a federal model, and reliance on an informed citizenry to maintain its republican form of government, all result from the events originally necessitating its creation, as well as the conflicts and compromises inherent in its writing and its ratification. So if I've done my job right, I've captured in one sentence the three questions inherent in the seminar question. So this provides our outline, doesn't it? We have our introductory paragraph that includes our thesis statement. Paragraph two, then, the main features of the Constitution include system of checks and balances, firm foundation on federal model, and reliance on uninformed citizenry, and the Republican form of government. So there's a four key elements of features of the government, features of the Constitution. Checks and balances, the Madisonian model, including the federal model, an informed citizenry, pluralism, a Republican form of government. So paragraph one introduces the thesis statement. I would argue paragraph two talks about the main features, and then we have a laundry list. Paragraph three, a good strategy in my mind, would be to take one of these and delve into it a little bit further. 
it's at this point that I would really strongly encourage a student to look at federalism and the federal model. After today's lecture in Constitution, next week in Chapter 3, we have federalism. So there's an entire two and a half hour lecture that talks about federalism and federalist theory. So while I'm, I'm offering you the opportunity to choose any of these elements, I would really strongly encourage you to choose federalism. It's so inherently important in our conversation. Then, paragraph four, result from the events originally necessitating its creation. What were those events? Shays' Rebellion, the Annapolis Convention. The next paragraph, the conflicts and compromises inherent in its writing the New Jersey Plan, the Virginia Plan, the Connecticut Compromise, the Three-Fifths Compromise, the Slavery Compromise, the Electoral College, the <coughs> language surrounding impeachment, the triumvirate versus the one-person office. Those were the compromises in inherent in its writing. The compromises inherent in its ratification, the anti-federalist-federalist debate, including the establishment of the Bill of Rights. So you can see this is a huge question, right? And we're talking at least eight to ten paragraphs. So when I said fearlessly editing, you can see where my, my, my beloved student who went on and on about the United States flag was terribly adrift. This is a very clean outline. It tells you what you need to tell your reader. And then you conclude, again, restating the thesis statement so that your reader has a sense of completion and accomplishment. Oh, yeah, that's right. They told me about that and that and that and that. You take a deep breath and you move on. Two and a half to three pages, double-spaced. If you find yourself, now please, I wasn't that long ago that I was a student. You know the old trick where you put your name and then my name and then the name of the class and then the date and the, and the name of the paper and that your introduction is like this long? You know that trick, right? We've all done it. If you find yourself doing that, my friend, something's wrong. You should be wanting to increase your margins and go from a 12 font to a 10 font. This is a huge question, right? You should find yourself needing to edit. And thus concludes today's lecture on the Constitution form and function. Please remember that this is chapter two in our textbook, Barbara Bard's American Government and Politics Today, the Essentials. Next week, we have Federalism in Chapter 3. As I've suggested several times now, Chapters 2 and 3 affect a combined essay. In other words, this seminar question, how and why was the Constitution created, includes the information that will be presented in next week's lecture in the Federalism Chapter 3 lecture why I took pains to suggest when looking at the foundation of a federal model as one of the elements in the Constitution, it would be really great, really wise to include that in your seminar question response. And so, my friends, this is it for this part for the Constitution. Again, I thank you for your attendance. I thank you for your patience. And I look forward to reading your essays Again, this is Mike Corrali with the Introduction to United States Government Online. Thank you, and have a great day.